How is everybody doing today? Blessed. Blessed. Hey, we're going to be in the Gospel of John, but I want to pray over the message and I want to read the text. We are going to be in John chapter 6. And I'm going to read uh, from verse 41 to the end of the chapter, and then I want to pray for our, our teaching. John chapter 6, 41. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves, for no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of, blood, of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. By the way, he's not endorsing cannibalism. We're going we're to get the teaching in a minute, so don't freak out. Verse 57, As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Uh, verse 60. Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew it in himself, his disciples complained about this. He said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Father, as we look at this text, this is an amazing text, and it can be kind of confusing, but not really, Lord, because you always break it down for us. Lord, Teach us to have ears to hear what your spirit would say to us, Lord. Every time we come to God's word, you have a word for us. And I pray that we would uh, have um, pay attention with intention, that we would anticipate that you have a word for us. I really don't think anybody can hear the Bible taught and not at least get something. And I pray everyone here would realize, okay, Lord, what do you have for me in this message? What do you want to say to me? So, Lord, bless the teaching and the listening and the ministry of your word. Uh, may you be glorified through it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may sit down. The title of this message is True Disciples Are Faithful Followers. True Disciples Are Faithful Followers. Last week I mentioned a quote I heard, and it was this. Jesus sought people, not position, nor popularity. Jesus sought people, not position, nor popularity. Jesus is so different from many so-called leaders you see nowadays are actually of, of all time. You always see leaders that, you know, they're, 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 their motives aren't right. But Jesus would purposely thin the crowd, so to speak, by speaking in parables, challenging them, giving them hard truth to make them count the cost to see if they were really willing to follow him. See, Jesus said to make disciples. He didn't say make converts. 
He didn't say make believers. He didn't say make fair weathered followers. A true disciple is fully committed. Jesus said in Luke 9.23, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. He went on later in that chapter, verse 62, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So Jesus is going to share some really hard things in this, peop in this chapter uh, to the people, and you're going to see who are really going to turn out at the end to really follow him. And so we have three main points. Point one is the people rejected him. The people rejected him. That's verse 41 through 59. Point two is his disciples rejected him. His disciples rejected him. That's in verse 58 through 66. And the third and final point is the true disciples accepted him. The true disciples accepted him. That's in verse 67 through 71. So point one, the people rejected him. Point two, his disciples rejected him. And point three, the true disciples accepted him. Notice here in verse 40, 41, we're going to talk about the first point, which is the people rejected him, because right away in verse 41, it says the Jews then complained about him. Right off the bat, the Jews are complaining about him after they saw his miracles. One of the saddest uh, verses in the Bible is what we read in John chapter 1, verse 11. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. He's talking about the Jews. He is a Jew. He's coming to his people, and the majority of them rejected him. And then in verse 42, it says, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? You know, people um, that know you are often the hardest to convince of spiritual truth. And Jesus taught this. He taught us in Mark 6, 4. He said, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, amongst his own relatives, and in his own house. Isn't that true? Haven't we seen the people we love the most are the hardest to reach? They say something like, I know who you are. I remember when you did this and that. Who are you to tell me what to do? What makes you so self-righteous? You know, and, they, and they're just like, hey, I'm just trying to show you about the love of God. You know, it's like, but they always come back with stuff like that. They're not easily convinced that you are who you say you are. And they're obviously checking you out too. But if you remember when we were in John chapter 3 months ago, John chapter 3 verses 19 through 21, we learned that they are not against you. They are against what you believe, or should I say, they are against who you believe, and they love their sin. That's why a lot of your people that you care about reject you. It's not you. It's who you believe, and they love their sin. And that's what we learn in John chapter 3. And then in verse 33 and 44, actually 44, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Isn't that an interesting verse? No one comes to Jesus unless the Father draws him. That's why a lot of times people will pray that, Lord, draw my so-and-so to you draw this person to you and that's an actual biblical prayer because it's the father who touches the heart of that person we're praying for the father draws him to jesus jeremiah 31 3 says god speaking i have loved you with an everlasting love therefore with loving kindness i have drawn you another way that the father draws people to his son jesus is through the cross through the cross in John 12 32 Jesus said and I if I am lifted up or if I am crucified I will draw all men to myself that's one of the reasons we do communion once a month we want to remember what Christ did on the cross but also it draws people to the Lord and we're a few months away from Easter resurrection day that is a great day to bring people bring relatives bring people that you love that don't know the Lord and they're gonna hear the gospel message and as we talk about the cross, God uses that to draw people to his son, Jesus. So keep that on your calendar, Easter. Then verse 45, it's interesting. He says, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. And you know what? They were being taught by God because Jesus was teaching them. This was a prophecy. This is prophetic about Jesus. And if they would believe that and listen to Jesus' words and obey what he says, they would be saved. They would have eternal life. Because it is the words of Jesus where we get that gospel message. Um, John 5, 24, Most assuredly I say to you, Jesus speaking, He who hears my words and believes in me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. When he says, and they shall all be taught by God, this actually comes from Isaiah 54, 13. But listen to how it's worded in Isaiah 54, 13. All your children shall be taught by God. And great shall be the peace of your children. Let me say this again, especially for those uh, of us that are parents 
and grandparents uh, to influence children. All your children shall be taught by God, and great shall be the peace of your children. We want to make sure all of our children are being taught by God. That's why we're doing the children's ministry. We're teaching our kids about God, but then us as parents and grandparents, we need to do that on our own. It's not the responsibility of the church. The church is just going to supplement what you're trying to do. But if they are taught by God and they learn of God, they are going to have peace. Isn't that what we want for our kids? We want peace for them. Then he says, Therefore, everyone who is heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And this whole passage, this verse 45, really speaks of the deity of Jesus, that Jesus is God. He says, And they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. See, we share this verse a few times where it talks about how the Old Testament was a little different in the New Testament because Jesus wasn't here yet. In the Old Testament, it tells us in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God, who at various times and in various ways past, spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, but has in these last days spoken to us through his Son. Because remember, Jesus is the Word of God. Now he speaks to us through Jesus, through what we read in the Bible. We read about God in there. And then in verse 47, I love how he says, he says, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. That's really the key of what Jesus is saying, not just in this teaching, but in the book of John, actually in the whole Bible. He who believes in me has everlasting life. That is like the message of the Bible. And that's the primary thing he's trying to say to them, and he's trying to say to us. I'm going to read verse 48 through 50. Uh, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. He's building on what he's been teaching us the last few weeks in John 6, uh, that he is the bread of life. Two Sundays ago, we talked about the miracle of him feeding the 5,000, and that set up his teaching the next week, which was last week, which I am the bread of life. He who believes in me, he shall never hunger, he shall never thirst. And now he's like, he's really amplifying that and building to this point right here. And verse 51, he says, I am the living bread. I love that. I am the living bread. You know why? We have a living faith. We have a living faith in God. It's not a dead God. It's not a distant God. It is a living God. Jesus said in Matthew 22, 31 and 32, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. See, we have a personal God that is active in our lives. This is not a religion. This is a relationship with God through his son, Jesus. All other religions, basically, it's an impersonal God. It's just a bunch of do's and don'ts, but it's not a relationship with God. And Jesus is the son of God who has taken away our sin problem, too. And so we have a, a, just a fantastic God that's personal. And even the Word of God, it tells us that the Word of God is living and powerful. It is living. I'm sure many of you guys have, have looked in the Word and God's spoken to you, right, off the pages of the Bible, because it's a, it's a living Word. And then he says, The bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. You know, Bible, Jesus tells us there's no greater love than a man would lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus did. In John 10, 18, he says, no one takes it from me, talking about his life. I lay it down of myself. He says, I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up. Jesus willingly laid his life down. That's how much love he has for us. You know, I was thinking about Valentine. It says that he loved the church so much he purchased us with his blood. Isn't that amazing? Amen. And yet, and there, I was thinking about this with it being Valentine's Day. He has come to heal the brokenhearted. I think everybody at some time in their life has had a broken heart, right? Yep. Raise your hand if you've had a broken heart. Come on, be honest. Raise your hand if you have a broken heart. Thank you. That's a little better. You guys can't lie in church. I mean, it just doesn't fly. Plus, it's the worst place to lie. But everybody has had a broken heart, and Jesus has come to heal the broken heart. And he's still doing that today. He's doing that. He's always done that. That's the ultimate Valentine is the love that Jesus had for us. It's just amazing. But then notice how he says, for the world. I love that. For the world. John 3, 16, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God is so amazing. His salvation is for everyone. He doesn't care who you are, what you've done. Every single person, the salvation gospel message has gone forth. How can we not be proud of him and just love him, you know? And now we're going to get into this little passage that, like I said, 
Jesus is not into cannibalism. It kind of sounds like it. It sounds a little weird, but think, think it through. Verse 52. The Jews said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said, most assuredly, I save you unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. You have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. He is once again using a metaphor here to teach spiritual truth. Jesus would always use parables and metaphors that would, would, would drive home a spiritual truth. And I think the real key is when you go to 57, verse 57, as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Jesus gave his life, his flesh and his blood. As we feed on him, we have eternal life, but notice it's more of a continual thing. It's a continual relationship. It's not like a one-time meal. It's you feed on me throughout your whole life. Are you regularly feeding on Jesus, the bread of life? What he's really saying is, are you daily spending time with him in prayer and in worship and in reading and meditating on his word? That's the way that we feed on Jesus. He feeds our spirit. He feeds our soul, if you will. You know, We are spiritual creatures. Once you become born again, you're not just a natural man. Now you're a spiritual man. Or a spiritual woman and you need to feed on Jesus to feed your your spirit and then he says in back in 56 I was thinking about this if you look back 56 says he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him he says abides in me this really also speaks of a, rem a reminder of communion you know we have the the bread and we have the the drink you know that's communion you know his his beaten bruised body but he shed blood for us for our salvation you know i was just thinking about this the blood of jesus christ cleanses us from all sin every sin not just the big ones not the little ones not the in-between ones every single sin the blood of jesus christ has cleansed us from guys that's good news Amen. that should just cause you to just go yes that is amazing because jesus said Actually, the Apostle Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's another reason we have communion. We want to always remember what God has done. We never want to lose sight of that, and we never want to forget that. That's what happens sometimes when we have trials and things are going on in life. We totally forget that Jesus knows and understands everything that we're going through. And we totally forget that he died for every single sin, past, present, and future that we commit. That's a hard one to wrap your mind around, but it's true. That's why we need to cling to the Lord, but we also need to remember what he did for us on the cross. It says, he who abides in me and I in him. That really means remembering Jesus' sacrifice for us, feeding on him through prayer, worship, and reading his word, obeying his commandments, and allowing him to work in us and through us. That's what disciples do. And that's what Jesus is really talking about. He's really challenging these guys. And notice the word abide. The word abide means to stay in a given place, state, or relationship. It also means to remain, to continue, to dwell, to stay connected. And I'm sure everyone here remembers that great teaching that Jesus did in John 15, 5. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me, stays connected in me, with me, dwells with me. He bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Then he goes on to say, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire to be done for you. That's the key to answering prayer, is abiding in Christ and having his words abide in you. And then he finishes by saying, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You will be my disciples as we abide in him and bear fruit. And Jesus is calling those that say they want to follow him to count the cost, to be fully vested, to be all in, to be true disciples. There's a lot of people that say they're disciples, say they're followers, say they're Christians, but are they? Well, that's for God to judge, but when I read my Bible, he's talking about disciples that are fully uh, serving him. This is what I want to say. Full commitment means full access to all that God has for you. Full commitment to God means full access to all that he has for you. You guys ever heard of a full access badge? Like if you go to a concert or you go to a ball game, you get a thing called a full access badge. A full access badge. Everyone else just comes in and sits and watches the event. They can use the restrooms, they can go to snack bar, and that's about it. You have a full access badge. You can go into press boxes, you can go meet the, 
the ball players or the, the people that are playing the concert. If it's a crusade, you can go to the money counting room, which is kind of funny. Why is the money county at a Christian event? But, oh, never mind. That's because they're making so much money on those other events, right? But a full access badge, that means you have access to all Christ has the more you commit to him. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God are yes in Christ. Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The more you're in Christ and you realize you're in Christ, the more you're going to just see God working in your life in a mighty way. In verse 58, he says, This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? That leads to the second point. His disciples rejected him. You're like, how can the disciples reject him? Stay tuned. You'll see it right now. This is a hard saying. You know why? Because there's many hard sayings in the Bible. Jesus gave them a hard saying. They're like, man, this is a hard saying. You know, in the book of Revelation, when John is in, in heaven, he's given a description of all the stuff that's going on in heaven. He's writing it for us to write. An angel came, a big mighty angel. He had this book. And he gave it to John. He says, eat this book. He never told you to eat the book. Can you teachers do that? No, okay. Anyways, he told him to eat the book. And this is what he said in Revelation 10.10. 10. Then I took the little book that was in the angel's hand, and I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. That's a description of God's word. When you take in God's word, it's like sweet honey when you see all the promises of God. But then it can be bitter when you get to some of the hard sayings. Can you track them with me? So the good news is like, okay, I open the Bible and, and I read about heaven. I read about forgiveness. I read about grace upon grace. His mercy is new every morning. You can have peace like a river. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The promises of God. That's the honey of the Lord. That is the blessing. Then you have the hard sayings. I need to forgive others. I need to forgive everybody. All sex outside traditional marriage between a biological man and a biological woman is sin. That's a tough one in our culture, but you know what? It's gospel truth. Here's a handful of hard sayings I'm just going to go through real quick that maybe you look at and go, what? Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. What? Yeah. Hate? Wait, 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 what? When he says hate, he means love less. It's kind of a play on words in the old language. And what he's saying is, he who does, comes to me and does not love less his father and mother and children cannot be my disciple. In fact, in Matthew 10, this was out of Luke, in Matthew 10, he just says, he who does not love me more than his mother and father and, and, and his relatives cannot be my disciple. So when you read that first one, it's like, wow, but that's the, what the meaning of it is. How about this one? Matthew 5, 48, therefore you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. What? Perfect? Who could be perfect? No one. <laughs> That's it. He, what, what he's saying is I, you need to strive to be perfect. I don't expect you to be perfect. I'm not saying if you're not perfect, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. He's telling us to strive to be perfection. That's what he wants because Jesus is the perfect one who gave us uh, the way uh, to salvation. But that's what he's saying is just you need to strive to be perfect, not that you have to be perfect. Here's a tough one. How about this one? If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Wow, there'd be a lot of unarmed people walking around in that place, right? Okay, what he's saying is what he's saying is there are some sins, there are some things, there are some people, there are some places that if you go or continue on. They are pulling you into sin so bad that they can lead you into hell. And he's saying you need to cut off some of those things. You need to cut off some certain relationships with people that when you're with them, you fall into sin. There's certain places you go. If you go there, you just fall into sin. And he's saying you need to cut that off. And he uses that example of cutting off your, your limb that it's going to be so painful because when you try to make some of these decisions, I'm going super hard. Number two, you're going to be misunderstood. Oh, what? You think you're better than us now? Oh, look at you, Mr. Holy Roller, you know? And you have to make this tough decision, and it hurts because you have to break it off. But you know what? 
They're going to send your soul to hell if you don't break off. You know what I'm talking about. There's certain things, certain things, places, people, or whatever that can pull you away. But that's what that means. Matthew 5, 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in her and his heart. You're like, what? What Jesus is saying, he's getting us to a higher, a higher plane of Christian living. He's saying what you think is just, is, is, is just as important as what you do. If you lusted a woman, but you don't touch her, you really wanted to, but you didn't. He knows that you really wanted to, but you didn't. So you basically have still sinned because you only didn't do it because you thought you would get caught. But he's also knowing, here's the other thing he's telling us, is what you think often will be what you end up doing. If you start thinking of it, you will often end up doing it. That is one of the reasons pornography is such an evil. When you start looking at that stuff and you start thinking about doing that stuff, next thing you know, you're flat out doing it. And so that is just evil to the core. But God is giving us a real glimpse of what the, 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 how sneaky sin is. It's in your mind and it's in your head. And you've got to nip it at the bud there and not think, oh, I'm just going to have self-control. How about this one? Matthew 5.43. You heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Pastor, you don't know this guy. I cannot love this guy. Well, Jesus would beg to differ with you. Often, when you love an enemy, that is the one thing that gets that enemy to even think about God. Like, wow, this guy's being nice to me. This girl is being nice to me after all I've done. They start taking a step back and go, wow, maybe there is some truth to this Christianity thing. That is a tool from God for two reasons. One, that he can use you to reach somebody else to bring into his kingdom that otherwise wouldn't talk to that person. The second one, is that, I forgot what the second one was, actually. Can anybody give me a reminder what the second one was? Okay, here it is. Thank you for, thank you for, thank you for reminding me. This is what it is. Is if you look at that person as an enemy and you keep an enemy, you know what you're going to do? You're going to be full of bitterness, resentment, hatred, anger. God wants you to forgive, to release yourself, to cut you from freedom. I mean, to cut you off from the bondage of that. See, forgiveness is for us who forgive, not, so, not really for the other person. You forgive not because they deserve it. You forgive it because God told you. And when you forgive, you release yourself. That's part of loving your enemies too. This is all a God thing. He knows what he's doing. How about this one? Matthew 10, 34. Think not that I came to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. Whoa. That sounds like a crazy verse. Well, what he's saying when he says of a sword, he's talking about division. I've come to set a man against his son and a, and a mother against her daughter, family members against family members. He says, your enemies will be those of your own household. What he's saying is you need to make a decision to follow me. And some aren't going to make. So that's why sometimes in families, not everybody comes to the Lord. Some choose the Lord, some choose not. He comes to bring division in a sense that he comes to bring us to a decision point. You need to make a decision. You're either for me or against me. And so that's what that means is, he goes, I didn't come to send peace but a sword. He is the prince of peace, and when you make the decision for him, you're going to have that peace. When you don't, you're not going to have it. But that's really what he's saying. Here's another one. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Wow, that is really narrow-minded. Actually, I think it's easy. He only gave us one way. We don't think we'll search it all over. It's like it's right here. And Jesus is the most popular person in all of human history. I mean, and if you seek the Lord, he says, he will, he will, you will be found by him. He will make himself known. So he's only give us one way. That is actually a blessing. And so all these difficult sayings, having a proper theology of God, meaning knowing his nature, that he's good, that he's just, and that he's love, that he is love, helps us to understand these difficult sayings. Being filled with the Holy Spirit as a born-again Christian helps you to live these hard sayings. Let me say that again. Having a proper theology of God, that's knowing his nature, that he is good, that he is loved, he is just, helps to understand these hard sayings. Being a born again Christian filled with the Holy Spirit helps us to live these hard sayings. And then they go on to say, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? Actually, anybody who really wants to can understand this stuff, if you really want to. Peter told us, that we've been born again through the Word of God. What we heard from this Bible, the Word of God, has we've been born again. He says, because of that, 
You need to repent of your sin and you need to, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. When you're born again, you're, you're a, a physical person, but now all of a sudden you're a spiritual new person, like a baby. He says, you need to eat, you need to feed on the word of God, and to you it's like milk. But then he goes on to say in Hebrews, everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in righteous, the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Solid food be, be, belongs to those who are mature, that is, those who by reason of practice have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. See, God gives us the real simple teachings, the basic elementary teachings as a new Christian. That's like the baby eating the pure milk. But as you grow older, you become a, a young child, an adolescent, a teenager, an adult. You're taking on more spiritual truth if you're reading the Bible and you're putting into practice. You're able to discern between good and evil. And it's like eating solid food. And he says, if you're not doing that, then you're not growing. And he, in the, early on in Hebrews, he says, you guys all ought to be teaching God's word, is what he told the Hebrew Christians. Interesting. So hard sayings, there are teachings and truths in the Bible that are hard to grasp, but God wants to help us with it. I love the quote by Chuck Smith. If you come to something in the Bible you don't understand, this is what Chuck Smith said, file it in a mental folder that says, until further revelation. Just put it in the folder. Okay, God's going to bring that to me another day. And just move on and trust the Lord. Also, pray though. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. James 1.5. Because this is what the disciples would do. Often you see Jesus teaching parables. And when all the crowds went, they go up to Jesus. Hey, what exactly did that mean? That's, that's our version of prayer. Jesus, what exactly does this mean? As you pray and read God's <coughs> word, he's going to give you the wisdom to figure those things out. Then verse 61, it says the disciples complained about this. And he says, does this offend you? I think the complaint wasn't so much that it was hard to understand. I think it was hard to accept and obey. I think they kind of got what he was saying. It's like, wow, this is hard. Like, I don't know if I can obey this. Or I don't know if I want to obey this. And then Jesus in verse 62 says, what then if I should see the Son of Man ascend into heaven before? It's like saying, so if I was like ascend into heaven right now, would you believe? It's kind of like, I just fed the 5,000. I just walked on water. I mean, you know? So in verse 63, this is this is probably the really key passage of this whole little section. Verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. The flesh profits nothing. There's three different meanings that different Bible commentators have thought. One, eating the flesh of Jesus profits nothing. That's kind of a duh to us, but they might have actually been thinking about it. I don't know. No, cannibalism, that's not the flesh that, that's going to feed you. The second thought was feeding the flesh by eating the free food that Jesus gave. You know, he fed him the 5,000, and they were like wanting to get box lunches the rest of their life or something. He's like, no, that is not going to feed you spiritually either. The third meaning is the life, living a life after the flesh. And that, I think, is the real meaning. You cannot live a life of the flesh. It profits nothing. Actually, it profits something which is... It'll send you to hell or it'll live, have you, give you a miserable life when you live for the flesh. He's saying, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. Let me say it again. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. It is through the words of Jesus that the Holy Spirit illuminates and communicates to the person of faith. He doesn't believe to a non-believer. A non-believer needs to be saved. But as a believer, he communicates and illuminates spiritual truth. Who here has not had the scripture like jump off the page to them? Like they're just reading along so this, like that was like for me. Am I alone? Okay, no liars. Come on, I want the truth. Did this happen to you? Yes. Okay, it's happened to you. There. That's the Lord speaking to you. And you know what? He wants to do that all the time. That's why he wants us in the word. He wants, did I make a mistake again? <laughs> One of the things I said earlier about the God, word of God is when you... You read the promises like grace upon grace. I'm just receiving it. I'm just receiving it. Okay. So anyway, but I wanted to say the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. One of the verses I've been sharing lately, I just feel this is a really good verse for this year, 2021, is John 16, 33. He says, these things I have spoken to you. These things I have spoken to you that you may have peace. He says, in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 
Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. You get so much peace out of just reading God's word and, and having him minister to you. And then verse 65, he says, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Remember I was, earlier we read that verse, unless the Father draws him? You guys remember the story when Peter... Well, actually, Jesus was with all the disciples in, in Matthew 16. They were in Phil, uh, Caesarea Philippi, and they said, Jesus says, who do men say that I am? They said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He goes, but who do you say that I am? And our, and our friend Peter speaks up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And remember what he said? He said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. That's his full name. For flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my Father who is in the heaven revealed it. It's the Father who reveals Jesus to us. It's the Father that reveals these things to us. And that's why we pray to the Father in Jesus' name. And then verse 66, a really sad verse. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Many of them. So we have the 12, but there were other ones that were disciples that were following him. They were listening to his teaching that were following, but were they really disciples? Sometimes when people leave, it can actually be a blessed subtraction. <laughs> Think about it. There are certain people, it's a good thing that they leave because they're not all in or they cause problems or whatever. I love what Leonard Ravenhill said. I'd rather have 10 people that want God more than 10,000 people who want to play church. Amen. Ouch. Amen. Whoa. It's like, whoa. Okay, I'll read it again since you asked. <laughs> I'd rather have 10 people that want God than 10,000 people who want to play church. Wow. Well, apparently Jesus thought the same. Verse 67, he turns to the 12. He goes, you guys also want to go away? It's like, I love it. It's like he's not begging them or pleading them or making the case. He's just like, you guys want to go away? And I love it because the spirit of God would not allow them to go. They were full of the Spirit. They were connected to the Lord. It's like, no, we cannot do that. See, this is what I realized. True disciples have thick skin. They won't be swayed by public opinion or difficulties or challenges, and they won't need to be talked into continuing. The Spirit of God is working in them. Listen to this verse. This is a pretty thought-provoking verse. There's probably people that you know that used to come to church and don't come to church anymore, and you're wondering why. Are they believers? Are they backslidden? Listen to this, 1 John 2.19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out from us that it might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Yeah. Pretty thought provoking. If they just take off, they probably never really were disciples after all. You know? You guys looking at the flame? Is it okay? Because this place is on fire. <laughs> I used that like I used that about a month ago. I just reuse it. Sometimes I recycle jokes. It's okay. But Jesus said in the last days, but he who endures to the end will be saved. He who endures. Gosh, endurance is like a key theme in the scripture. True believers will be there the whole way. I like, I like what it says in verse 68. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. How did Peter know that? He's the same guy that said and back in, in uh, Matthew 16, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. See, Peter modeled the principle of Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, Jesus uh, walked with his disciples for three to three and a half years and Peter was there. He listened to all the sermons. He had so much of the word of God and he's like, forget these bozos. I'm staying with you, Lord. I, you have eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. Why don't I go anywhere else? That's the power of knowing God's word and being in God's word. You're not going to be swayed. You're not going to be talked out of this stuff. And the last thing that Peter said to us in his last book, chapter 2 of Peter, the last two verses, he said in 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18, Beware lest you fall away from your own steadfastness, being led away by the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. That's what he was saying. Stay in God's word. Stay serving the Lord. And in these last days, that's what we need to do. Not give up and stay in God's word. And then verse 70, 71 is a real sad ending for uh, Judas. Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? God, would you like Jesus to call you that? 
this saying it kind of gives you the willies, you know? So this guy would not continue on. But as I said earlier, true disciples are faithful followers. They will be for Jesus and follow Jesus to the end. Paul told Timothy, and he tells us the same thing in 2 Peter, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He finished the race. He fought the good fight. I was, I, I was thinking about this quote the other day about Winston Churchill. Most of you know, some of you guys know who Winston Churchill is. One of the biggest wars of all time was World War II. Back in the late 30s and early 40s, World War II, it was called a world war. Winston Churchill was the prime minister for Britain. Britain was the only guy, the only people that were really able to stand up. And Germany just kept coming and saying, if we can take out Britain, we can take the world. And they kept coming over and bombing their island of Great Britain over and over. I think they did it for like two months. Like every day they had a bomb raid or something. And he said this once. This is the lesson. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty. Never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. And you know what? They didn't give up. And then next thing you know, America got into battle and, and, and the rest is history, as they say. But never give up. And so, as we close this message, I want to say something about Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day to the married. Never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. The enemy would love to get in and destroy every marriage. Ephesians 5.22, uh, um, Ephesians 5.22 through 33 is probably the best teaching on marriage. I'm just going to read through it real quick and make a couple of comments. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, or not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are the members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The husband is taught to love his wife as Christ loved the church. That's an unconditional, sacrificial love. And that's what we just read about. Jesus gave his flesh and his blood for the church. That's us. And then in John 13, 1, it says Jesus loved them to the end. Even though he knew one would betray him, one would deny him, and they would all flee, he loved them to the end. That's the love us as husbands need to have for our wives. We love them to the end, unconditionally, sacrificially. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. It is a step of obedience to the Lord that you respect your husband. Not like the complaining people in verse 41. See, the, the, the wife is like the church and submitting to her husband, the Christ. There's an, there's an example. So the wives are not to be like the complaining people in verse 41, or the fair weather disciples that bolted and left in verse 66. Or like Judas who betrayed Jesus, they're to be like the 11. That even though they blew it, they all came back and they all followed the Lord Jesus. And this is what I want to say, guys. Marriage is an absolute gift and blessing from God. But here's something more important. It's a responsibility from God. God has called the husband and the wife to be an example of Christ's love for the church and the church's submission to Christ. And he has designed it so when people see that marriage... 
a good marriage, a solid marriage, where husband is loving his wife, the wife is respecting him, they're not gossiping about each other, they're enjoying life together, they're, they're having fun, they're supporting each other, and they just love each other. The, the, the world looks on and goes, wow, tell me about your God. That's what he wants for us. I'm not trying to throw a guilt trip on you. I pray I'm, I'm giving you an exhortation because this speaks to me. This speaks to me. So what I want to do is I want every married couple to stand up and I want to pray for you. All the married couples, please stand up. And then as soon as we get done with this prayer, we have a gift for you. So bow your heads. Father, I thank you. Lori and I thank you so much for these couples at Impact Bible Fellowship. Lord, you, you call them not only to have a marriage and to fall in love and stay in love with each other. You call them to be a witnessing tool to the world. You call them to a mission field. And Father, I pray all of us as husbands would humble ourselves before you and even humble ourselves before our wives. And we would love them unconditionally, sacrificially. And just as you've extended grace to us, that we would do the same for, for them when they blow it, when they drop the ball, because we're going to as well. Lord, I pray for the wives. I pray that they would all respect their husbands and uh, recognize that they have a husband that's been put in that authority by Jesus. And it's a submission to the Lord that causes them to respect. And I pray that they would unconditionally and sacrificially respect their husband too. It's a sign of the, the church's love for for um, Christ, Lord. So, Father, we pray for each one of our marriages that we would be what you want us to be, that we would learn more about how to be that husband and how to be that wife. Lord, we need your help. We need to remember that we need to forgive and we need to be forgiven and we need your help. So, Father, bless and minister and strengthen each one of these marriages and use them for your glory and your purposes. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.